All right. All right. We are live on we Facebook. Live. It's a Friday night. Time for evidence based triathlete. It seems that yep. we're early, but we're really not early. Yeah, we're both on Mountain Standard Time. Yeah. And uh, it is definitely uh, it's 605. But uh, yeah, Vegas time, we're, we're a little early. Uh, you know, wanted to get, get get this done a little early because, you know, John, after we talk, I kind of realized that I feel so good after we talk that I actually have trouble falling asleep. Not because I'm of anything else. I just enjoy our conversation so much that uh, and, and we're thinking as we're going and I have a hard time sometimes winding down. So I still probably won't be able to sleep tonight because, you know, race tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, we'll knock on wood that we'll be able to we'll be able to get a good night's sleep tonight. Uh, it's funny. I'm actually the uh, the same way. And and yeah, we'll we, we'll have some fun tomorrow. And uh, I am. In uh, look at that. You of transition yes that's transition up there the white tents and uh what was that a shimano vehicle there is that what that was? yeah there were a couple shimano vehicles up there yeah yeah so yeah it's been fun to uh be this close to uh transition at a big race like this I'll go back to my yeah. well you know john if you think about it now with kona not happening this probably this is the biggest race of the year right yeah st george like, is the new kona globally? Yeah, St. George is the new Kona. Yep. And, um, you know, when you look at the pro start list, I mean, not everybody is here, but man, it is the who's who for the, for the most part. And, um, and even the age groupers, I mean, there's people from all over the world here. And there's a lot uh, of fit people here right now. There is a, there is a lot of fit people here. And, and, and it's, you know, it's I, just fun. It's fun to be around that. Oh, it totally is. And and I enjoy it. Like I was went for, you know, short bike ride and short run this morning. And, you know, you're seeing people take pictures of all, and I do the same thing. I just still take pictures of this area. It's so beautiful. And I'm just sitting there. I'm like, these are people from around the world, around the country, and they're enjoying what's in our backyard. And this is in essence, a home course event for us because we, we race, you know, sections of this pretty frequently with our, our local races. So it's really neat to be able to share that with, the rest of the country, rest of the world on an event like this. Yeah. And honestly, like St. George and this, this whole area is just such an awesome place. It, mm -hmm. it, it is absolutely um, breathtaking, you know, and uh, we, can't, we sometimes take it for granted how great of a place it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I, wish I, bought, I wish I would have bought a place here about 10 years ago. Uh, yeah, right. I think you still can and you're still getting a return on investment. It, it's uh it's a pretty popular place and who Absolutely. knows with uh saint george being the new kona maybe this is the place to uh to have at least a trailer spot to park in so. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're absolutely right you're absolutely right so you know we talked a little bit about the course and everything last time mm -hmm. um today was interesting though because both of us uh, got a chance to look at some bikes and yeah. look at uh what people are doing um and i'm going to call it morphing their yeah, bicycle yeah. you know uh we've spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about aero and talking about bikes and bike position uh marginal gains as it were mm -hmm. but man it is it is in full force here and uh you know i'm taking notes yeah i um i was going around scratching my head and i was like why am i not doing that uh, but some of the we, we both, you know, thought of the fairing rule, uh, yes. but I, I, I think what caught my eye, which is funny, it caught your eye as well, is the, the between the bar setups for hydration. That really yep. caught my eye on, on several uh, bikes. Yeah, the, the, you know, just for the people that aren't here, what people are doing is they're doing a typical between the bar bottle, but then they're taping all the way around their arrow bars so both arrow bars so there's no you know there's basically no gaps mm -hmm. um in between where, where basically where their arms are and where their bottle is and and no gaps underneath their arrow bars and where their bottle is either mm -hmm. and uh you know my question is is that truly functional or is that a fairing and uh for people that don't know the uh, a fairing is a is, is a something you put on something else to basically make it more aerodynamic. So in, in 
people do this a lot in the cross country bicycle uh, mm -hmm. tours where they actually will put a plastic shield in front of in front of their bike, kind of like a windshield actually. Yeah. And it drastically reduces your, um, your drag or your, yeah, yeah your drag. Yeah. And in triathlon, you know, we've been, you know, I don't know, flirting with uh, rules uh, as far as aerodynamics and stuff like that for a long time. But what I'm seeing here, and it's the first time I've seen it live, I've, you know, I've seen a few mm -hmm. things on TV with some pro triathletes that it appears to me that some of these setups are, yes, functional to a certain extent, but also uh, seems to me to be breaking the USAT rule for sure. Well, but even uh, the integrated front ends are really, they've come, become such a clean setup. I, yeah. mean, I looked at a couple of them. I'm like, man, I gotta, I gotta change this up because, you know, that's a lot of um, change of CD uh, or yeah. how well the air flows over the bike. And the more you can clean up that front end, you know, obviously a lot of us are cleaned it up, have cleaned up the front end by wire management, routing our wires through the bars, down through the headset. And you don't have those cables sticking out, you know, like, you know, bikes from 10 years ago or what have you. Uh, but to clean up even the front hydration makes a lot of sense. But yeah, where's the, where's, where's the line out tomorrow, I guess, if there's um, no penalties and yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it, it, to me, it's interesting, like, where we do draw the line. And, and it also is a little bit disheartening to me as well, because a custom front end, 3D printed, and this is what's happening at the high end, and they're being actually, some of them are being 3D printed in titanium. Yeah. Um, $6,000 for the front end for, for, for a, a, a handlebar setup. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we've talked already about the fact that triathlon is ex is expensive. That might be my um, It could be out of the reach of people. You start mm -hmm. throwing a $6,000 front end on your bike. Yeah. Yeah, where does it end? It's tough. Well, and I, did you see, I'm sure you saw in the uh, expo, the, the arm cups that yep. were extending out really almost all the way up to your wrist, which again is one for comfort and so it's functional. On the other hand, that that could lead to a really clean uh, setup. I didn't check the price on them though. But, uh, uh, the the full setup with the with the whole with the whole bar and everything, I think is eleven hundred. Yeah. Uh, just the scoops themselves, I think you can get for three hundred ish. Mm -hmm. Um, but those are you know, yeah. I I've actually been looking at some some different uh, solutions for this mm -hmm. and. And honestly, to get it where it's all integrated in and, and not just added, like not just not just your elbow pads being scoops, but like actually integrated in. And you're looking at at least at least a thousand. Oh. Right. And, 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 you know, many people already paid about a thousand dollars for their, uh, you know, five hundred or a thousand for their arrow bar setups. So and now you've got to replace that. Yeah. New system. It, it's and, a, and, it's and then you got to then the other is, issue is because of the way they're set up to actually have a, a hydration system in the front end on top of it mm -hmm. there's proprietary um wedges and screws yeah. and all these things to, to actually get it get get the hydration as well and then that, that makes it even more expensive yeah. so yeah it's a man it's it's a tough one but i think ultimately john if this continues the price will come down right and, yeah. it, and it won't be custom builds it'll be it'll this will come to the masses and um you know and hopefully it won't be much more than uh, the arrow bars are uh yeah. are now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's always a, you know a, a cost um benefit uh you know you've got to look at how much you're spending and and what you're really going to get out of it i i still say going back to improving your bike setup you know, if you're going to invest in anything, invest in good tires first and foremost. Uh, yeah. that, that that's pretty critical because bad tires, it's like you're always going to be riding uphill. Good tires, yeah. at least you're it won't won't have that same uphill uh, sort of feel to it. So, John, then, did you have any thoughts on on these front ends and then also handling? So, I mean, obviously you have a you have a you have a maybe a smaller frontal area, but maybe you have a larger side area. Mm -hmm. And then the other question I had is like, 
and it's on Jan Ferdano's bike, right? So he has his arms set up like this. Mm -hmm. like his arms are almost touching. Yeah. And that's fine if you're a pro and you have right. these huge gaps in between you and you're rarely ever passing somebody and you're a great bike rider. Yep. But to me, I get concerned that age groupers are going to be going narrower and narrower with their mm -hmm. hands and aren't really the, you know, that great of bike handlers to begin with mm -hmm. and uh, can be creating havoc out there. I do actually think that that might be um, a safety issue. No, oh, that's a great point. I mean, the, the wider your arms are on the handlebars, the more overall control you have of your front wheel, not only yep. just from a steering perspective, but like what, what you're talking about, even from a crosswind perspective, you know, you get hit by a crosswind. If your arms are really narrow, you're yep. going to have a harder time controlling that front wheel than if your arms are wider. The downside of having the wider is you're opening yourself up and that's that CD. You're catching that air, that that wind um, in your chest more so. Yeah, that's why you want to have a little bit of a front water bottle fairing set up. <laughs> um, it's interesting. The one company, uh, Vision, they you know they sponsor EF uh, mm -hmm. and the pro and the cycling tour. They came up with an integrated system that's actually more like a triangle. So the hands okay. are together, but it's wider in the elbows, and I think they're trying to create like yeah. a V, basically, mm -hmm. like. And this is on their world tour, uh, world tour cycling teams. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure they did a bunch of, you know, Vision is known for their aerodynamics. Yeah. Uh, they, they did a bunch of modeling. And so, you know, it'd be interesting to see, you know, you get somebody in a wind tunnel and look at the difference between here and here, right? As, I, and I don't know the answer because, you know, we don't have a wind tunnel yet at UNLV. Yeah. We're going to get one one of these days. We will, yeah. <laughs> well, I think I think what's important, and, and we've talked about this in the past, and you've been good at bringing it up, is you know you can't just be drawn to what you look like from the front, because we're going to be hitting getting hit from the wind from all different angles, and if the tendency is if you're getting hit by uh, wind on the angle to come up out of arrow, you've yep. now destroyed all the time and money you put into getting this narrow arrow position because you're not feeling comfortable on it. So you pop up. It's, it's you're, over. You're, you're hurting. So I wonder if that's what vision's looking at is uh, whether or not you're able to increase your time in arrow by having a different type of bar set. Maybe you sacrifice a little bit of straight on, uh, but you know, we call looking at CD from different angles, you know, the yaw angle, you know, right. what angle the wind is actually hitting you from. And, uh, and, and, and there, you know, there still is an optimization of this idea of managing the bike and staying in arrow versus popping up and coming out of it and losing all that advantage. Yes. Yeah. It's, oh, th once again, this is all fascinating stuff. And, you know, John, uh, it all it takes is money. <laughs> you could, we could test all these things and, yeah. but, um, yeah, it's, well, and the other thing is it's money, but it's also like, can you get these things to fit to your bike? Yeah, that's right. right. Do, you, do you have right bolt patterns? And, you know, the one I was, I, I was looking at one uh, out of Europe and they actually had the conversion kit for my, my bike. And I was like, oh, oh. Well, you know, but then it's like a $200 <laughs> extra uh -huh. just for, for like the right spacers for my bike. And uh, it's, well, yeah. You it's, know what I forgot? What's that? My Aero socks. You did? I did. Yes, I'm a little disappointed because that's a pretty low cost item. That is a really low cost item. Uh, but it doesn't take much to put them on and they're, they're not going to hurt. They're not going to add drag and they're only going to help. So I'm a little bummed that I, my Aero socks are in my drawer at home. So Yeah, you just lost four watts or three yeah. watts yeah. Yeah. potentially. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah it, you know it's it, it's interesting like, so that i mean that is such a low-hanging fruit but very few people actually do use aero socks i mean i've only used them for the last couple of years yeah and but i guess that's where they you know sort of become more popular in, in the last couple of years the one thing about the aero socks are they are a little bit more difficult to get on in t1 yeah yeah, yeah but i well. think if it, even if it takes an extra 20 seconds you're going to gain that mm-hmm mm-hmm so, um, you know, I actually have aero socks and aero sleeves, and it depends on what, if it's wetsuit legal or not. Yeah. If it's, if it's, if it's wetsuit legal, I'll wear the sleeves okay. because I can have them on as yep. I swim. Yeah. If it's not wetsuit legal, you can't have them on. So then, 
then they're, uh, I have the arrow socks. I don't think we're going to get to 76 tomorrow. Well, that storm just missed us. That's true. That, our, that maybe was our last chance. Yeah, maybe um, there'll be some water that comes down. Well, it's supposed to be 61 tonight. If it's mm -hmm. windy in 61, there's yeah. a chance. That's true. It was windy here just a bit ago. Yeah, yeah. So if in the middle of the night we get a wind, a wind storm, mm -hmm. uh, which can happen here. Yeah. You know, because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of weather around. Mm -hmm. That's that that's the that's the chance. But either way, it is what it is. You know. Well, um, and I I tell you, I, I'm a bum, I'm bummed about my my socks, but I did bring my uh, long sleeve arrow shirt, and I'm going to wear that. And partly because the wind direction for this race is largely going to be a headwind or you know side wind, and so I want as much arrow clothing as possible. So. Yeah, so the, the one thing for me, I was thinking about this one of, of not going with a long sleeve running is, uh, or riding and running is the heat. Because I was more worried about the heat. Because uh, if I overheat, it doesn't really matter. Like if I, if I gain one or two minutes on the bike, but I get a little hotter, mm -hmm. and especially running in long sleeves, I, I personally feel like I get a little hotter. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, we'll see, right? No, that's a Might good point. You've got to you got to be thinking about all these factors. It's not yeah. as simple as oh, if I do this, I'm going to go yeah. faster. It's not it's not that simple. Yeah, because the truth is, like you could go all the way. Are you going completely long sleeve running? Yeah, riding. So you go all the way there. I mean, you're you're potentially losing the ability to cool. Yeah. Um, as well, and they, I mean, it's a balance. You're right. It's an yeah. absolute balance. And then, get, John, I guess the question for you would be, what would the heat index have to be for you not to wear? the long sleeve you know um i i the i've used this particular shirt in hot temperatures before and i know that as long as i keep it wet that that uh that convection that that cooling of the arms actually is oh. is enhanced a little bit and so yep. the trick though is to make sure i pick up a water bottle at each aid station and i douse my arms i keep them wet as opposed to letting them get dry. Now, what I don't know is what happens to the aerodynamic properties of the shirt when it when does wet. become wet. So I may be, you know, doing all this for naught, but. Uh, so then the, and the other question we did, we literally just talked about this. How much out of arrow are you when you stop or slow down, get a water bottle and you're sitting up and yeah, pouring yeah. water on yourself? Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you losing the gains that you and we don't know the answer to these. This is the no. and this is the fun part of triathlon. We don't know the answer. No, but and yes, we going into aid stations, and you and I are both we are big advocates. You've got to watch out for everybody. Don't blast through them because um, all it takes is for one person, a volunteer, even to reach out at the wrong time, or someone to veer off in one direction, or someone come up behind you and there are too many stories of accidents happening in uh, bike transition. So, yeah, my goal in, a, in, in an aid station, if I need something, is to stop or sorry, to, to get it at the first person. Like, oh, if yeah. it's water, oh. I need, I want to grab the absolute first mm -hmm. one and then, yeah. then look over my shoulder, yeah. make sure no one's in the way and get out of there. Yeah. Like, get as far left as I can. No, that's good. But yeah, make I, sure I, you look because people will be trying to sneak in in front of you. Yeah. So look, make sure it's clear and get, get yeah. out of there. Yeah, I do the same thing. And I, and I really, you know, look over my shoulder, shoulder as I see the aid station, I'm looking back right then. I want to yeah. know who's behind me, who's coming yeah. up hot, what have you, but yeah, it's really a, a dangerous area. Agreed. Agreed. So some of these, um, aerial things that we're talking about are, are performance, um, enhancers and they cost a little money, but there's some things that don't cost money and that's, body size and we've talked about race weight of course yeah. this is such a complicated topic it is so complicated so let's just start out with this and just have the users kind of or the listeners kind of think about this if you were just to write it down like what do you think your ideal race body weight would be because i'm thinking for me like 98 pounds yeah <laughs> right. uh, yeah like, I'd be obviously being facetious here. I, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll give the same sort of sarcastic. I, I would say 10 pounds less than what I weigh now. <laughs> Whatever I weigh, yeah. I want to yeah, be 10 pounds always. less. <laughs> yeah. 
That's the mindset. Yeah, and and and, and it's so tough, right? Because we look at, and, and, and I hate to do it, but everyone looks at professional athletes or mm -hmm. the top, top age groupers, yep. right? And you look at them from the outside and you're like, oh, if I, if I looked like that, I would be faster. Yep. And, and the truth of the matter is, it's, in my opinion, it's simply not true. Mm -hmm. If you look like that, you are probably um, having endocrine dysfunction. Yeah. You're probably having bone mineral density issues. Mm -hmm. You're probably not a very healthy individual. No, and, and that even speaks more volume as we get older. No, that's what I'm saying. Uh, for an age grouper, right? Yeah. For somebody that is 35 to 75, mm -hmm. to maintain that look mm -hmm. is not sustainable. Yeah. Especially for somebody that, okay, it's, I do think it's different if you are a um, pro athlete, you've got a, someone that's monitoring your nutrition, monitoring your coaching, monitoring everything for you, doing regular blood work, especially endocrine testing and uh, immune, immune um, system testing and white blood cell count and white blood cell percentages. You got someone doing all those things for you, then potentially you could get to, mm -hmm. to that weight. But for the vast majority of us, it's not, uh, it's not a healthy thing. In my, in my opinion, it's not a healthy uh, thing to do. No, and that's, that's so true. And, and, it's not always, and, and it's not only just the, the weight issue, but it's the, what we call the body composition issue or how much yep. fat you have and how much non-fat weight that you have. And uh, the fat is, you know, typically what we look at and we say, we, we don't want that. Well, actually, we do want a certain amount of fat to, in order to be healthy. You know, and I'll just go over stuff you already know. Uh, you know, you need fat that uh, covers the nerves that send signals to and, and receives information from the body or sends information to the muscles and gets information back. Those are all covered in fat. Uh, and it's, that helps with the signal transmission. And then you also have fat covering organs to make sure that they're protected. And so there's a minimum amount of fat that we talk about as being essential body fat. That's still a pretty low number. Uh, yeah. it's, it's less for men than it is for women. But man, if you start approaching that minimum body fat uh, percentage, you, you're running into some challenges because we don't have a group, you know, there's not a singular best way to measure your body composition. There's a number of different techniques and they're all estimates. Yeah, I, I'm gonna add one thing to that, John. So you mentioned the, the, the organs and the nervous system, but don't forget literally every cell in your body has a phospholipid bilayer uh, for its cell mm -hmm. wall. Yeah, yeah. Phospholipid means lipid is fat, right? So mm -hmm. literally every cell in your body Yep. has fat around it every cell yep. and it's important to understand that fat is not a, 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 a evil right right and i think that too often or for for too long our society in our society we've deemed fat as the enemy mm -hmm. and really like think about you and i right now we'll add another piece to this what what substrate are you using right now probably more than others a lot of carbohydrate <laughs> well, right now maybe a lot of carbohydrate but in general just sitting here having a conversation you're burning a lot of fat yeah yeah you're you're utilizing a lot of uh, of lipids for mm -hmm. it for for the energy source right now and when you're sleeping mm -hmm. you're using a lot of lipids mm -hmm. and um so yes and then john let's go to that we don't it's really difficult to measure body comp mm -hmm. but then it's also really really difficult to say in triathlon what is the ideal body comp yeah yeah and and i and, and john so that's a question like so if a student was to ask you that question how would you respond what is the ideal body comp for a male 55 years old competing in half iron man or or sorry 70.3 or iron man how, how would you answer that it's, it's an unanswerable question because it's it you know Obviously, you don't want to carry 
inert weight or weight that doesn't help you move forward. So it's not like we would go do a race and add on a you know 10 pound backpack and then and think we're going to have an improved performance. But that's exactly what you were saying is that that's the way that that negative connotation of fat by itself, but fat's a wonderful fuel source. So you need some fat and you need to be able to access that fat during exercise. And that's the trick. And so what it's funny, what I often tell people when they ask me this question about body composition, I'll actually borrow from a, a friend, Jackie, that, that I heard this from. She would tell the athletes to go look at the finish line of an iron distance or half or whatever in race they're interested in, go look at the finishing time that you would expect to come in at. And then look at those body types and you will see all different types of bodies uh, at that expected uh, finish time. And so, it, you know, there are a, a lot of body types that are successful really at all different levels. You know, it, it can get to a little bit towards the pointy end uh, when you're really at that high end. But even, you know, you look at the pro triathletes, we're seeing all different size pro triathletes. I mean, look at the Olympic gold medal winner. I mean, he, he's a diesel engine. You know, I mean, it, it, he know, is to, thick. Yeah. And I, and, you know, and I would be kind of bet money that he's going to be on the podium here tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Right, so not only can he do it in, you know, in the blazing heat of, uh, of Tokyo, which people would say, oh, you don't want to have extra weight. Mm -mm. Yeah. Um, he's going to do it on the hills in St. George as well. In my, in, yeah. in my opinion, I think that's going to happen, yeah. but who knows? Yeah. I mean, I'm not a, yeah. a prognosticator, but he's not the prototypical type. And you look at someone like Javier Gomez, mm -hmm. right? Dominates, uh, you know, triathlon for five, five, six years, seven years. Mm -hmm. Pretty thick guy. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, Jan Ferdino. So tall. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's again, all different types of body sizes, even at uh, the elite. Uh, level. I, I, I think you need to, weak link to, to do what you just said. Yeah, so, and I, I love the fact that you just said, because once you get to that, you know, you go out to a race and you actually see what's truly out there and the people that can be successful at different body weights, I think that is, that, that does open people's eyes to a certain extent. Yeah. But I also would contend that we often associate, or at least what the research shows us, we all we often think that, well, the research, what we, what we came up with basically says that nobody's happy with their body yeah. weight. No, no triathletes are happy. Some men want to be bigger, mm -hmm. right? Uh, all oh, sorry, 98, 97% of women wanted to be smaller, yep. but nobody was happy. Yep. And so I think that as a culture, we need to, and John, you and I can start this in our grassroots podcast right here, is be, just be happy with yourself. Like we're yeah. doing this, like mm -hmm. just, just, doing a triathlon is an, is such, to me, is such an epic thing. Yeah. And if, if you do it at 210 pounds or you do it at 110 pounds, just be happy that you can do these things. Like we're adults and we're playing a game. <laughs> That's so true. That's all it is. It's just, you know, going out and playing and uh, yeah. swimming, biking and running for, for fun. And yeah. as, you know, the, it's hard not to get caught up into that body image though. And it, it is, um, it is interesting how it is a, a, a large percentage of people just aren't happy with what they look like. Yeah. And, and you know, I'll, I'll add another piece to this in, the, in an analogy for you to think about. So how many times, well, we were talking about this already. Have you went to a race and looked at other people's bikes and like, Oh, Oh, man, that, yeah, bike, or, always. that bike is so <laughs> nice. If I had that bike, yeah. I, I, oh, I'd be even faster. It's the same with bodies. We look at other, other people's bodies. Oh, gosh, look at that body. If I had that body, you know how fast that would be? Yeah. It's the same. We, we want things that we don't have, yeah. right? The grass is always greener on the other side. Uh, no, you are spot on. Now, I'll also add to the story. We do a lot of body weight support research in our lab. And we have a specialized treadmill that lifts you up while you run. So you can run at 95% your body weight, 90%, all the way down to 20% your body weight. And I always love, you know, doing lab tours and whoever I'm doing a tour with, I'll put them in that treadmill and pump it up and lift them up. And then I go back to 100% their body weight 
And without fail, no matter what size the person is, no matter if they're underweight or overweight, they will all say, oh my goodness, I've got to lose weight. <laughs> because running is hard. Yeah. And it would be the same if you get unweight on a bike. Yeah. Like if we had a, if we had a bike treadmill that you could take weight off of people, yeah. mm -hmm. they would feel the exact same thing. Yeah. No, so, sure. so, so you, know, in, you want to go, talk go about that paper a little bit in terms of the uh, body image and, and perceptions? Yes. So I did allude to a few of the things already, but the first one, the first statistic for me, and we can uh, put a link to this paper in the, uh, on the Facebook page, but um, the first one for me that uh, we'll talk about is basically what people thought they were compared to what they were. So this is actual body mass index versus perceived body mass index. And that um, as far as percentages of, of males, 75 or 76% I think they're larger than they actually are. Mm. Like that's pretty interesting, right? Like they actually think they're bigger than they are. Yeah. And uh, for women, it was only 25 or there's 13 percent of women thought that. So that's an interesting one to me. 76 percent of men are, actually think they're bigger than they are. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you think? What do you what do you attribute that one to? I don't know, but I've been there. And I remember for a long time, I was uh, always buying large size shirt because I always thought I was a large or an extra large. And then yeah. I, I forget what happened, but it was all of a sudden I, I took a shirt off and I said, oh, this is a medium. This is comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to change my, my, uh, my thinking. I'm like, okay, maybe I'm just a medium. Yeah. Well, I should get some context to this. So this is interesting. This is uh, with another Caroline Charlotte. Um, this is back in 2002. This is the honestly the latest information we could get on this. This is from 2002. Yeah. So, and then so the women one that's that one wasn't too surprising for me on on that statistic. But then um, when we look at think they're smaller than they actually are, 23 percent of men, 86 percent of women. Yeah. Think they are smaller than they actually are. Mm. So it's it, to me, John. This is like the ultimate question, right? Is why is it that we have this dichotomy between uh, between men and women? Yeah. Like it, and it's so drastic. Like mm -hmm. an overwhelming percentage of men think they're larger than they are, and an overwhelming of women think they're smaller than they actually are. Mm -hmm. And so, what creates that? I mean, is this is this just in root, ingrained in our culture? Well, this is this is a, not my area of, of research at all, but I, I do think that it is a lot of marketing and what we see and what's in front of us. Everything from you know advertisements that we we all see, you know, even you know games that that kids play and you know toys they play with, you know that it, it's. Um, it is part of our culture in terms of uh, body image. What's the perfect uh, body? Yeah. So in this, this dysmorphia, right? That's what we call mm -hmm. it, where, you know, not happy with, with your shape. And, you, and, and I think that if you think you're smaller than you actually are, and you do do a body comp or you do weigh yourself, that can have a real negative mm -hmm. uh, implication. Right. If you think that you're 130 pounds and it's in your mind, I'm 130, I'm a size six. Yeah. But you're actually 140. Yeah. That can be, you know, can, can be can be devastating to people. No. And I think this is what really cool about these papers that uh, that, that uh, Bernice actually sent to, to us. Yeah. It's the one talking about dependence on physical uh, exercise. Because we get into this mindset that sometimes we need to exercise, not necessarily for our fitness or race performance, but because it has to do with body image. And that and, can lead to an eating disorder. And the, and the guilt associated with yeah. not training and not addressing that body image. Because like, yeah, if you, if you think that you're 130 and you're 140, you're yeah, you're going to do things that potentially aren't very healthy. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think this this hits close for home, to home. Obviously, I think there's you know anyone listening to this is going to you know if you just think think amongst you you know within yourself you probably are feeling this. But even today, I had on my schedule I needed to do a 15 minute swim. Well, I don't have a car right now because I dropped it off down in St. George. You can't swim in the lake right now because the uh, because the events closed off the uh, the lake for access. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, no, I really need to swim. <laughs> but then it really had to take me to take, take a step back and say, that swim is not going to impact my race tomorrow. So it's going to be okay. And it's funny how uh, we as, as triathletes, we do get so ingrained in this routine, but we do need to really sometimes just take a step back and say, it's going to be okay. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's probably... I mean, it's pretty bad for self-coached athletes as well. Mm -hmm. When you start as a self-coached athlete, athlete saying things like, oh, I can't do that because I have to run tonight. Yeah. No. You don't have to. Yeah. Even if you're coached, no. you don't have to do this. Remember, this is a game. We're playing a game. We're adults playing, playing around, have, playing a game, right? And I'm guilty. I'm just as guilty of it as anyone else. Mm -hmm. right? And not guilty of it, like, I'm not saying guilty, so it's the wrong word. I'm just as bad or good. I don't know. It's not even bad. I'm just, I'm right. doing the same things. Right. Right. And uh, I think that we need to be able to give ourselves, and I'm, once again, I'm not a psychologist either, but we need to, be able to give ourselves a break and give ourselves a pass, right? Mm -hmm. That, that it, if you miss a workout that was scheduled or that you think you should do and you miss it, it shouldn't spiral you into, a, into guilt. Mm hmm because once again, we get to do this. We're playing a game. Yeah, that's right. This is not, this is not life and death mm -hmm. at all. Right. And it's, but it's hard to wrap your head around that. And, you know, um, I try and have more fun with this and not take it so seriously. You know, I take it seriously when I'm racing. But the question that was, you know, this was back to two weeks ago that we had about, you know, do you ever race for fun? And I'm like, I think so, but do I really? And, right, and right, I, right. I took that, I actually took that question to heart and I was like, mm -hmm. you know, I want to race for fun. I'm doing this for fun. Right. And if, and if I become unhealthy because yeah. of body composition problems, that's not good. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to go back to one other thing. We've talked about this a long time ago, John, is that, the number one rule in triathlete, triathlon, in my opinion, is number one, be healthy. Yeah, that's right. Like that's, we're doing this, we're supposedly doing this because it's a healthy thing. But if at any point this not, is not healthy, and I'm talking both um, psychologically and physically. Mm -hmm. And I think, you're, I think you would definitely agree. And, and John, I gotta be honest with you, you as my friend, um, you've helped me with this. Because uh -oh. sometimes I don't, sometimes I don't see that, and it's nice to have someone like you right. that we can, you know, we talk about. You know, you're mm -hmm. like, hey Ted, you're doing, you're doing just fine. Like, yeah. you're too hard on yourself, and mm -hmm. and this is for fun. And and I think you, the people that are listening, like, you need to have a friend yeah. that can put things in perspective when when you when you lose perspective. No, that's a great point because our self talk sometimes it's so easy to 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 go down a negative path, and and that is going to influence performance. And you and I are both involved with this sports research innovation initiative and our mission is to optimize health and maximize performance yeah and and i think that that is such a, a critical mission because we really do and health is health can take many angles i mean it's not just physical health but it is mental health boy we yeah. really need to bring on a, a, a sport performance uh person for this yeah, a, a sports psychologist, I'd, I'd love to find one. If anyone knows one that has dealt specifically yeah. with adult athletes. Mm -hmm. So many of the sports psychologists that I know work with collegiate and youth sports. And you start getting this stuff in with lifestyle yeah. stuff. And they don't. Yeah. And many don't have this perspective. Or they've worked with professional athletes. We're in a pretty unique world here, John. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With, you know, most of us are adults with, not myself, but with children of our own. Yeah. and responsibilities of our own and jobs and own businesses and all these different things. Our, our psychology is going to be different than a 22 yeah. year old college athlete. Mm -hmm. It has to be. It has to be. Yeah. So John, let's move on to a couple more of these statistics. So the one I really love is 
for want to be larger or want to be smaller. Mm -hmm. So want to be larger for male, 63% want to be larger, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting in triathlon. Yeah. Um, and only 36.8 want to be smaller. Mm. But that one, uh, that actually surprised me. And I love, that's what, you know, John, I love reading research when it surprises me. Yeah, right. That's why we do it, because we don't know the answer. Or we we don't know we the answer. Through, but you got to ask the question and collect the data. Yep. And then um, the one that bothered me was for the females, 2.7% uh, want to be larger, 97.3% want to be smaller. Mm -hmm. And nobody was happy with where they were. Yeah, that's right. But think about that. 97.3% want to be smaller. Yeah. And when they broke this down in further into um, people that were already underweight, mm. the, remember this was, uh, there was people that were underweight, overweight, obese, nor normal, as far as the BMI scale. Yeah. Um, it, it fell across all, uh, all realms. Mm. And to me, like, obviously this is a little bit older paper, but this is, once again, the, the most recent data we have on this, that's kind of troubling to me. Yeah. And, and I don't know the, I mean, obviously I'm not here for the answer. I'm just here to bring that up. And, and one of the things that, you know, maybe the answer is, is that, Hey, listen, everybody. So as far as female triathletes, everybody wants to be smaller, everybody. So you're all the same, right? Mm -hmm. So can we all just shake hands and agree that we're all good? Yeah, that's right. Well, and I think you're right that it is troubling because what it can lead to is what I mentioned, eating disorders. And when you're, you know, an eating disorder is you're not eating uh, to uh, optimize your health. Uh, and it can also lead to exercise addiction. And well, the, and the two together. Yeah, that's right. That's, that can now have you know terrible implications for not only your health but your relationships your status uh even work and what have you and the addiction part uh when you when we throw that word in with exercise means it has a neck exercise now has a negative connotation on yeah. your health or lifestyle yeah and you know john we will do this um you know sometime sometime this fall uh we'll talk about uh red s uh, mm. in, in, in depth. So relative energy deficiency in sport. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's the new buzzword for this, where it is an eating disorder and an exercise addiction mm -hmm. mixed together and, mm -hmm. uh, and how common it is in endurance athletes and athletes in, in, in general. And yeah. we'll definitely go down that road. I, I have a full lecture that I teach on this, uh, in one of the classes I teach Great. on. And uh, so we'll definitely come back to this, but, um, yeah, and then, you know, obviously we need to be on the on the lookout for that with our friends and um, and ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've I've alluded to it in the past. Um, you know, I've not always had the most healthy relationship with food and with exercise and the combination of them. Um, and you know, I'm getting better personally. I'm getting better with it. And you know, you know this, but like I don't weigh myself. Yeah, right. I, I have. I have not weighed myself in four years mm -hmm. and I feel better about myself now than I ever have. And That's great. I, to the point where I literally, like, I go to the doctor and they like, they want to weigh you. I turn around on the scale and I tell them, I don't want to know. Oh. And my doctor knows that I don't want to know. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's for me, super healthy to not, to not know. And so if somebody asks me what I weigh, I'm like, I'm somewhere between here and here, and I don't know. Yeah. And I now try and judge myself based off of my FTP, my run pace, yeah. my swim pace, my racing more than like that, that metric to me, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And, but it took, it took a long time to get there. And I had to, you know, I do have some serious self-talk mm -hmm. um, and I still am at a point and I'll, I'll, I'll share this. Like I'm still at a point where I could be, if somebody weighed me right now, I could be devastated. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm right. serious, John. Like, not, and I could fall into an eating disorder. Interesting. Uh, yeah. I just know myself. Like, I, and so I don't want to know. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll even share this. So the high levels Zwift racing, you know, requires you to weigh, weigh yourself in. And I just guess, yeah. right? And, but one of the things in the high level is, is that you can actually, they can, um, make you do a live weigh-in with your phone oh, interesting 
Okay. And like, I'm so fearful that that's going to happen on my team mm. because I don't want to know. And so I've tried to figure it out, okay, can I do this in a way that my wife can, can right. do the video and look and, right. and enter my stuff, but then it goes into the results table and I'll see it. You eventually come across it. Right. And, and, and honestly, it's, it, it scares me. And, 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 you know, I know this is not, this is not my psychology talk right now, but this is real. Right. This is, and I'm sharing this with people because to let people know that this is a, this is a this serious. Is, no, it is serious. real. And I, I think it's great that you are are sharing that because I'm I'm sure people are listening and, and feeling the same thing about looking at the scale and dreading it, or you know, basing how they feel for that day based upon whatever that scale tells you. I think I think the weight, especially in the Southwest in our region, man, it, you cannot you cannot you know, really rely on that scale because you don't know how much hydration you've either taken in or that you, you know, you've left out there from exercise. You know, we're going to race, you know, tomorrow it's going to be hot, you know, yeah, maybe it will rain, but it's going to be hot and we are going to lose a lot of weight, but really it's just all water. It's all fluid. And, you know, I've gone out on rides in uh, Las Vegas and dropped, you know, 10, 15 pounds uh, and, but still taking in fluid at the same time. And it's just, you know, that, that, that weight by itself is just not a good metric of health. Yeah. yeah and, and John, what would happen to me is I'd go on this long ride on a Sunday and then I wasn't able to replenish, but I'd weigh myself on a Monday morning and yeah. I'm like, Oh, look, yeah, that's where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And then I'd weigh myself again on, let's say a, a Thursday. Right. So I was indoors most of the week and, yeah. you know, maybe a little bit outside. And I would have gained six pounds. Yeah, right, right. And I'm like, and it devastated me. Yeah, right. That's right. And you're you're absolutely right that that needs to be a, a part of the solution. But one of the papers that we looked at prior to uh, tonight actually to did buy a, a um, oh sorry spectro a spectrometer. I bought a spect a spectrometer, mm. and so I could actually measure the specific gravity of my urine. Mm -hmm. So I was. I wouldn't, I, I, when I was weighing myself, I was trying to make sure I had the same specific gravity. Yeah. So my hydration was mm -hmm. taken into account. Oh, that's good. That's smart. But that's, you know, and they're not expensive. You can buy, uh, you can buy them for like 50 or $60. Mm -hmm. These are like this prism and you look into it. The, there's electric ones that are a couple hundred bucks. But if you are someone that does weigh themselves to an hour triathlete, I recommend getting something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so then you know at least that your yeah. hydration level is the same. That's a yeah. great. That's a great uh, point. And what's interesting is um, one of the papers that we read prior to tonight looked at the correlation between body weight and performance. Yeah. And we we often equate those two. Like we started out talking that oh you know the lower the lighter you are the better you are, and the correlation was not strong at all. I mean, it was, it, it was there, but it wasn't strong. The what? It was there, but it wasn't strong. That's right. It wasn't, it would explain maybe you could predict 30% within 30% of how accurate your, um, your performance time will be, which is not going to get you there. I mean, that's not, that, that, I'm not going to Vegas with, with those odds at all. No, in terms not of with 30% body weight to predict performance. Yeah, and the, the thing that also and we did we did talk about this. That paper was um, on twenty. The average age was twenty one, and these were collegiate triathletes and doing Olympic distance racing. And so that makes it to me it, it's interesting. Yeah, but it that's a different world to to what we're doing. But I but I still think if you were to look at it like you know if we were tomorrow to take I don't know hypothetically I wish we could do this. Yeah. Take the 400 guys in my age group mm -hmm. and weigh them all. Yeah. I mean, what would the, what would the slope look like versus the slope of the, of their finish times? I think it's going to be like, like this. Yeah. Now I also do think though, probably the, you know, the, if you look at the top 10 and the last 10, mm -hmm. the top 10 will be lighter versus the last 10. Yeah. Right. Right. But it's not going to be super strong. Mm -hmm. the, the, the correlation. Yeah, that, that's my thought. I mean, obviously, we didn't do this research. And I, and I wish we could do something like this. Um, it's too bad that, you know, because Ironman, 
um, for full Ironmans, they, do they still take people's weights? Yeah, yeah. No, you know, they haven't been, uh, I haven't been weighed now before race. Mm, I'm trying to think when the last one it was, but yeah, that's tip, that, that was usually part of the protocol. So that would be interesting if we could get that data, right? Or someone could yeah. get that data and actually look at it, mm -hmm. body weight in an age group versus mm -hmm. position. And again, like you're talking, when we talk about the extremes ends of performance, you're yeah. getting a little bit tighter in terms of body yeah. type. But even if you look at that range in that performance, you're still going to get a, a range of, of body types. And, and, uh, yeah. and yeah, oh, yeah. Within the, within the top 10, there'll be a range. And within yeah. the bottom 10, yeah. there will be a range. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And so I guess the, the, the message in reading all this, these papers, the message to me uh, ultimately is we don't know the ideal body mm -hmm. composition for a triathlete. Mm -hmm. Don't and, step on the scale. And, and, if, yeah, and, and, me, and, and yeah, me, maybe measure yourself like I'm doing based off of performance, not off of body weight. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I would say is that invariably, invariably, once your volume gets to a certain minimum threshold, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're not able to hold on to yeah. to that much excess body weight mm -hmm. i mean most triathletes when we look at this is actually some other research uh are in calorie debt most days uh yeah, that's right and i actually i was going to say when you start looking at big swings in weight you actually want to really pay attention to that because that that is not necessarily a good a good thing to drop a lot of weight all of a sudden so so uh john the other one that uh, in las vegas i noticed this in the summer um I'll have big swings in body weight on a day I don't train mm. where I lose a lot of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's my body is like when I'm training consistently outside in particular, that my plasma volume, my blood, yeah. my blood volume goes up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, as a survival mechanism. And if I don't train, I mean, in air conditioning all day long, um, I will yeah. lose a lot of body water. On that mm -hmm. day, I don't know if you've you've experienced something like that. I haven't I, I haven't followed it that closely. You know, I I will step on the scale, and then I go, why did I do that? <laughs> so, but I I um, but yeah, you know, we could look at. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at the li literature that's on there on fluctuations of body weight throughout the day. Where we talked about it, circuit for, for me, it's on an off. It's it's only on the off day in the sun, and it's almost always in the summer. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like I will, I'll go to the bathroom like 15 times that day. It seems like, yeah. and, and I'm, there's volume right mm -hmm. coming out. And I'm like, I, I don't know what's going on. Like I, oh. I didn't drink any more today than I have. Right. And, but I really think it's, it's like the body's recognizing, Hey, I don't need to hold on to all this water. Cause you're not putting me out in 110 degrees and riding your bike around. That's right. All right. So that is another interesting one. Oh, wow. Good topic. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome stuff. So, um, yeah. So John, good luck tomorrow. You too. Should be, hopefully we'll have some fun out there. Um, yeah. the weather seems to be changing minute by minute. It is. We, we might get a thunderstorm during the race. Oh, that's my question to you. Oh, this is such a good question. At what point do the race organizers pull the plug in the middle of a race? If there's a lightning storm, uh, I'd have to go back and look there, there are guidelines for that. And, and, oh, and really, I think it, it just breaks down to, uh, the safety of the athlete. Uh, so there are guidelines to it, but my understanding is, is that oftentimes those guidelines are neglected in, uh, mm -hmm. big races. Well, I can think of, uh, Ironman Texas one year, it gets stopped in the middle of the race, uh, Lake yep. Placid, uh, the swim got started and then they stopped. Uh, there were, uh, there are examples of it happening, yeah. uh, but I think it, for that to happen correctly, not only do you need a good race director, you need a good medical crew to really um, have a protocol in place to identify when, it, when the athletes are unsafe. Or in I, I think that, I think the big issue here is where do you take people? Yeah, right, right, right. Because the, you can't just, let's say we're at the lake. Okay, well, don't get in the water. Well, where yeah. are you going to stand? Where are you going to go? Like they need to be sheltered. And yeah. there literally is no shelter other, and there's no cars going to be out there. Mm -hmm. So normally you could actually, a safe or spot is in a car 
Yeah. Uh, there's no cars out there. No, no. And, and I remember uh, that was the discussion at Lake Placid when that did happen. And that actually is one of the situations, even believe it or not, with lightning strikes and, and swimming in pools that are outdoors, is do you pull everyone out of the pool and have them on the deck? That's not very smart. Uh, you might as well be in the pool at that point. But yeah. I guess you could, uh, you know, here in St. George, the safest place will be a trailer. <laughs> You're, John, you may have 60 people in your trailer tomorrow morning. That's right. You know? I'll be charging a little bit. There's not a lot of room in here, though. <laughs> yeah, but even like, think about it, like on the bike course or on the run, even yeah. like, where, where are 3,000 people going to shelter no. in place? No, and I, and I think that's, I remember looking at guidelines uh, uh, some time ago, and it was athletes need to get to somewhere safe. Yeah. Well, you know, it depends on the course, whether, you know, whether, you know, here in St. George, there's not a lot of, of coverage. I mean, you're looking for an underpass or something that you can get to, but there's really only one, I think, in three that would be close to the course that you'd be able to uh, jump under. So, so in that in that case, as far as like a liability thing, um, because the it is known that there's not places, I think they have to be more cautious and yeah. potentially help halt the race um earlier than they would somewhere where there was shelter available yeah so let's just hope knock on wood that doesn't happen yeah but yeah. knock on wood we get the clouds not the rain i think we're all going to be watching the radar tonight and see where it's at yeah for sure cool all well, right have john a great day tomorrow i'll see you in the morning yeah we'll see you in the morning and we'll see you afterwards for one of those non-alcoholic beers yeah there you go that would be fun all right all talk right. soon okay bye-bye